a strange, weather-beaten man sitting in the shadows near the wall. He had a tall tankard in front of him and was smoking a long-stemmed pipe, curiously carved. His legs were stretched out before him, showing high boots of supple leather that fitted him well. Greetings, adventurers. My name is Kramer, and today I have made boots. And doing so has led me down the very long rabbit hole of talking about medieval footwear. What types of shoes were actually available historically in the medieval period? How do they compare to wearing modern shoes? And what should you be looking for for your costume? The purpose of shoes is to protect your feet. And by and large, throughout the medieval period and through many other cultures as well, the method for doing that was simply by using a thin leather covering for your feet, essentially a leather sock. And there are many different styles and variations for this because people found lots of different ways of attaching leather to their feet. Regular laces, wrappings, toggles, even slip-ons are all viable options. And the regular laces actually surprised me a lot because I wasn't expecting to find them. They look very modern to me, but they do actually exist historically. So I've avoided using laces like that with these boots. And I've also avoided having any sort of tongue for the shoe because I wanted it all to remain one singular piece of leather because that will keep it as waterproof as possible for as long as possible. Originally, I was hoping that I would find one definitive answer that I could point everyone towards and say, this is the shoe that you want, but it ended up not being exactly that simple. So if you are a historical reenactor, then I leave it to you to do your own research about the region and the time period that you're portraying, because there are so many options, it would be very difficult for me to put all of them accurately into a video. So for the rest of us that are just looking for something more authentic or more believable than what we have right now, I have created a little chart for you that you can fill out to identify exactly what you're looking for and what the different elements say about your character. You're free to skip to that section of the video now, but I highly encourage you to watch the whole thing because I'm going to explain why I chose what I chose. You can't unravel the history of a world that never existed without understanding the history of our world first. In the medieval period, historically, that is 500 AD to 1500 AD, the most common type of shoe that I have seen examples of are a form of turn shoe. The turn shoe is called such because it is sewed together inside out and then flipped right side in when the sewing is done. So you end up with a seam on the inside of the shoe and on the bottom of the shoe. Very generally, even boots tended not to be higher than ankle height. That is probably because the materials and the cost of labor were such that it didn't make sense to use more than was necessary in order to accomplish the very simple task of just protecting the bottoms of your feet. Now, Vikings used winningas or leg wraps, generally made out of linen or wool, in order to give themselves a little bit more warmth and support and protection. So if you are a less well-to-do character or a character of older origin, or perhaps even just you are more budget-minded and don't want to spend the money on a tall pair of boots, using leg wraps with a pair of shorter boots or shoes is a very viable and historical option while still giving you the silhouette of having taller shoes. Because as far as I can tell, tall boots like this are not accurate to the medieval period. In fact, no matter where we look, no matter what time period we look, shoes generally tend not to be as tall as knee height. The only one that I can really think of, the most prolific one, is actually riding boots. And that is because the length of the boot serves a purpose. It protects your calf while you're sitting in the saddle all day. The advent of the heel was also meant for riding because it makes it easier to catch in and control the stirrups. So one might logically say, at least in a fantasy setting, but perhaps in the historical settings as well, that a taller boot or a boot with heels or both is more indicative of a higher class character, not only because they can ride a horse, but because they can afford the horse and the proper equipment to ride it. But what I have seen is that it is actually not the height of the boot that is an indicator of social status, but the length of your toes. This is purely a fashion thing as far as I can tell, essentially saying, look at me, I can afford super long toes. I don't have to walk around that much because I'm rich, look at me. Uh, so for those of us that are going on adventures, I think we can safely ignore the long toes. But if you're at a LARP and you're playing a merchant character or a more aristocratic character, it actually might be really awesome and really funny if you were walking around in these highly impractical shoes. There are a few other types of shoes that I've seen examples of, some slightly before the medieval period and some slightly after, but generally speaking, 
Shoes at the time period are simply a leather covering in order to protect your feet. Turn shoes can have either a harder sole or a soft, very thin sole, but the uppers are always soft leather because it's easier to sew, especially when you're turning the shoe inside out. So the one thing I will say to avoid is boots or shoes that have a structured toe box because that is indicative to me of a technology that is more advanced than was available in the medieval period. If you are working a job or in an environment that requires more protection for your feet, you would logically assume that you would want thicker soles too probably first. And so what I've seen in the historical boots that I've been researching is actually that you have a thicker sole that just rolls up over the top of the toes, creating this sort of upturned pointed look. Because it's easier to do that than having a hard upper and a hard sole and then trying to sew them together without a machine. And so that is exactly what I have done with my moccasins. I have given them a slightly thicker sole, more durable, because I expect to be walking around on perhaps sand or rocks and sometimes pavement but I wanted them to still be as flexible as possible. Wait a second, moccasins? Moccasins aren't medieval. Very astute of you, viewer. You are absolutely correct. I have not seen examples of shoes that look like this from the medieval period ever. And the key difference that perhaps you have already noticed is that a turn shoe is sewed over the top of the foot onto the underside of the sole. Whereas a moccasin, at least the ones that I have, the sole is actually sewed towards the top of the foot so that the stitching is outside and on the top of the shoe, giving it this sort of boat look. So why did I make moccasins if I knew that they weren't medieval? Well, the very boring answer is that this was the only pattern at the height that I could find, and I wanted a boot that was going to be very easy to make because this is my first pair of shoes. But the perhaps more interesting answer is because of the terrain that I'm in, because shoes were designed in order to function in the place that they were meant to be used in obviously. And this is where making moccasins has actually been very helpful to me for doing research because I was able to find a lot more information on moccasins than I was on turn shoes for I think the very simple reason that moccasins are still being used today. Whereas the turn shoe hasn't necessarily disappeared, it's just evolved into something else. When I look at the development of shoes going back from the Middle Ages up until now, I can see a direct line between the turn shoe and the modern dress shoe. They're both made out of leather, they both have leather soles, and they're both stitched together on the inside. So by and large, they are actually very similar, except that the dress shoe has slowly evolved over the course of many years towards having a thicker sole and a heel. Why is that? Well, we can look at the moccasin to get our answer. Soft-soled moccasins were intended to be worn in forested, softer areas like this in the northeast of America, whereas the harder-soled moccasins were intended to be worn in the desert, where the sand is abrasive and you're more likely to step on rocks a lot of the time, which would wear through a thin sole very, very quickly. And modern hunters still use soft-soled moccasins today because they allow you to walk through the forest so quietly. And of course, moccasins are still being used by their indigenous respective tribes. So now if we jump back over to the medieval period, I think it becomes a little bit more clear why the turn shoe evolved to have a thicker sole. And it is because as society is progressing, a person was more likely to find themselves walking on wood floors or stone floors in various buildings, bridges, or roads as the culture was developing, whereas that wasn't happening over here in North America. So those shoes changed and these ones didn't. And I do wonder if having that wrapped up shape is actually better for walking in wet conditions than a turn shoe where the seams are on the bottom and perhaps more likely to accept water. The way around that in the medieval period was a lot of people had what were called patens, which are just a wooden flip-flop essentially that you slip your foot into when it's raining so your feet never touch the wet ground. But I don't think they had those here in North America and thus the shoes might have developed differently. If that hypothesis is correct, then it might mean that in a fantasy society where there are a lot of people going on adventures, that moccasins would have been created and they would be the preferred type of shoe for an adventurer. You might even be able to tell who is an adventurer based on the type of shoes that they're wearing. So how do these compare with modern shoes? What can you expect if you buy or make a pair of shoes like this? Well, the first thing that you'll have to deal with is that you'll need to learn how to walk differently in them. These are very much a barefoot shoe, which is a modern trend or rediscovery uh, of shoes that have very thin soles. So you're essentially walking around in bare feet. You have to walk with a less heavy heel strike in order to distribute your weight properly so that you don't hurt yourself on harder surfaces. On the grass, it's very comfortable. You might even find yourself walking with smaller steps. Now I've seen it described by 
uh, members of the barefoot shoe community that as you're learning to walk in them, you should aim to walk as quietly as possible, as if you're sneaking around and then you'll walk correctly. I would say that the opposite is also true, that by wearing the correct shoes and walking correctly in them, you will simply be quieter as a byproduct. Which is something that John Flanagan understood in his Ranger's Apprentice series when he described Halt's boots as being soft sold in book one. Now I have to admit, I am a little bit at an advantage here because I'm used to dancing in jazz shoes and ballet shoes and dancing barefoot, so I am predisposed to finding shoes like this comfortable. But just because there is a learning curve doesn't mean it's impossible. Theoretically, uh, with a softer shoe that will expand with your foot, you'll have better balance, meaning you are less likely to hurt yourself. So the anecdote that I will share is that the only time that I have hip or knee pain when I'm going on a hike or some sort of adventure is when I'm wearing shoes like this that have a very inflexible, thick sole especially when they have heels. And that is because shoes like that make you overcompensate with muscles that aren't necessarily meant for walking because your feet and your ankles can't do what they need to do. Trust me, I've had two very severe ankle sprains on my left leg and wearing shoes with a very thick sole where you don't have a lot of mobility, it is dangerous to walk around where you don't know if the terrain is even. It's very easy to injure yourself. Also understand that with shoes like this, they're never going to be 100% waterproof. If you walk around in the pouring rain, if you step into a stream, your feet are going to get wet. But I'm happy to report that with these shoes, treated with the snow seal and the design that I chose, I walked around the other day after it rained in the grass for about 40 minutes or so, and my feet remained completely dry. There wasn't even water stains or anything. So I've made a little chart, a little quiz for you to help you identify exactly what type of shoes you're looking for. You can copy it off your screen or look for the PDF in the description, and I'll show you how to use it by using my own shoes as an example when I fill it in. Feel free to make your own versions and add to them as you see fit, because the goal is to give you a tool that is helpful. So across the top here, we have the three categories that I'm working with. There are shoes, boots, and then heeled shoes or boots. Shoes are for commoners, normal everyday folk. Historically, they're the most common and can be augmented with leg wraps for extra protection, creating a cobbled together sort of look. Boots are for adventurers and riders, wanderers. More protection for the legs, not as common, but not implausible, and historically, ankle height on average. Heeled shoes are for cavalry and aristocrats. Heeled boots would have come about sooner than heeled shoes, and this also connotes a later time period or the end of the medieval period. So we'll be working in the boot column for now. And now for our options, we have rounded toes, which connote a more practical person. A pointed toe is someone who is more fashion forward. A soft sole is the cheapest option and more nature oriented, meant to be used in lush terrain. A harder sole is harder wearing, better for long walks, hard labor, or rough or cold terrain. Proper laces, like we would have on a modern shoe, are sophisticated, requiring better workmanship, and they are less weatherproof. Toggles require more crafting, but have an antiquated style, suggesting less refined materials or more rustic lifestyle. Wrapped laces are a practical, bundled, or cobbled together look, and a humble and simple solution to how to attach your shoes to your feet. Now we'll look back at these moccasins to see how I did. They fit in the boot category, they have rounded toes, a harder sole, and wrapped laces. They are still really flexible. So from our little chart, we can see that these boots should fit with a character that is potentially going to be riding, but does a lot of wandering on foot in varied terrain, perhaps hunts, and values functionality and not much else. And don't look at that. Aragorn's boots are almost identical. In the appendices for The Hobbit, directed by Peter Jackson, the costumer says that Costumes start from the shoes, and I've said completely anecdotally in a video of mine that costumes start from the ground up. People notice your shoes, and you should pay special attention to them too, because really narrowing in on a single design can help inform other choices for your costume, so there is a sense of cohesion. For example, these shoes are laced up with a leather string. Eventually, this will be leather. I lost the original string, but, they, but it also has that crisscross style. There's a crisscross style on my bracers. And even the bag that I chose to wear today has the same color and texture as the shoes. So everything fits together. So if you spend the time to get that single element, your shoes right, you can follow the logical path that leads you down to pick the rest of the elements of your garb without getting lost in having to design it from scratch and getting scared that you don't know what you're doing, which can totally happen when you're learning a new skill. Which brings us to today's video sponsor, Skillshare. 
I am constantly on the search for new skills to learn in order to add to my video making arsenal. Now I'm only one man, but I want to have a production style that makes it seem like I have a whole team behind me. And there is an absolute lot to cover. But that's why I really appreciate the structure of Skillshare. Because a good teacher with a well thought out lesson plan will tell you everything that you need to know and answer questions that you didn't even know you had before you've even thought to ask them so that you can spend your time just learning rather than figuring out what it is that you need to learn in the first place. For example, I just finished the course an introduction to filmmaking by David Ritchie. Really great introductory course, and it lays out all of the logistical stuff from pre and post production to marketing. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. The first 1,000 people to use my special link in the description will get one month free so you can explore classes on filmmaking, character illustration, creative writing. The search for knowledge is endless. So check out Skillshare with the link below in the description, and a huge thank you to them for sponsoring this video. I have a whole playlist of costume related videos here on my channel. I will recommend this one right now, which goes over how I chose all of the options that I'm wearing today to help you get a feel for what different elements of your costume say about your character. But wherever your newly booted feet take you, I'd like to wish you good luck on your adventures.